Okay, yeah, then I think we can start with today's seminar. Uh, the speaker is Mackenzie Warren, and we will hear about using the entire toolbox, exploring core collapse super using spherically symmetric simulations. Yeah, so I'm going to talk today about uh, different ways of exploring core collapse supernovae using uh, computer simulations. Um, and as Ingo said, I'm a postdoc here at Michigan State University working with uh, Sean Couch um, in the astronomy program. Um, changing slides could be a problem. Okay. <laughs> Did you? Okay, I'll just do it manually. <laughs> Nothing works. Too much technology. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, why is it changed here and not? Is there a delay? No, that is weird. Are you sharing your screen yes. still? <laughs> <laughs> that is okay. weird. Can everyone still see my title slide? Is that stuck? Yeah, we only see your title slide. Okay, that's that's good. Uh, not really. <laughs> okay, how about now? Yeah, okay. okay. Okay, so to give you all a brief outline about what I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm going to first give a brief overview of core flap supernovae, what they are, um, what we know about them so far, uh, and then finally get into our current understanding of the explosion mechanism of core flap supernovae. Um, my third item will be making the case for spherical symmetry and why we need spherically symmetric simulations in our understanding of core flap supernovae. Um, I'll talk then about our current efforts to model turbulence in, in spherical symmetry um, and why that's an important project to undertake. Uh, and then give you some preliminary results of this project uh, before moving on to what's next and uh, future, future directions for this work. So what is a core collapse supernovae? Just to make sure we're all starting off on the same page about what, our, what we're talking about here. Um, when you think about the lives and mass of stars, the, the evolution of stars depends highly on their, their original mass um, when they're born. So very low mass stars like brown dwarfs and red dwarfs do sort of very unexciting things throughout their lifetime. And they sort of live for a very, very long time. Uh, stars like our sun, um, live for a slightly shorter amount of time, become kind of very nebula and leave behind white dwarfs as their, their remnants. Um, but more massive stars, uh, about 10 solar masses or so, will go through a faster uh, evolution and have shorter lifetimes uh, and result in, in supernovae explosions, what we call core collapse supernovae, um, leave behind either neutron stars or black holes depending on their progenitor mass. Um, so when we think about specifically these, these massive stars that lead to core collapse supernovae, what we have are these massive stars that are about 10 solar masses or, or larger. Um, and they've gone through these phases of stellar evolution where they're burning progressively heavier and heavier elements in their cores, uh, starting with, with hydrogen burning and then now burning all the way through until they're producing um, iron and silicon in the, the very center of their cores um, with a layer of silicon burning going on around it. Um, and at this point, it isn't energetically favorable for this star to continue burning, burning iron into heavy, heavier things, so it sort of gets stuck at this phase of evolution. Uh, and this, this core, this iron uh, core, is supported against uh, gravitational collapse by this electron degeneracy pressure. But this electron degeneracy pressure has sort of a natural mass limit that it can support. Uh, uh, the Chandrasekhar mass, um, which for uh, an iron composition is about 1.48 solar masses. So once this iron core reaches that mass, um, it can no longer support itself against gravitational collapse. The set core of the, the star starts to, to collapse downwards. Um, and this is sort of the beginning stages of what we call a core collapse supernovae, hence the name core collapse. So this first stage is the, uh, the collapse stage. Um, so these diagrams, um, I pulled out of a paper by Thomas Janga. Um, so on the, the, the y-axis here, we see the, the radius scale. The x-axis gives you sort of a mass scale of, of what's going on. On this upper, upper up, uh, portion up here, we'll show you sort of the, the fluid motions and the directions of the fluid flow. And this lower portion here will show you what's going on with the composition of the material and what the neutrinos are doing. Um, so at the onset of this collapse, at about t equal to zero point, and what we have is we have this chandrasek our mass um, iron and nickel core that starts to emit neutrinos uh, through electron captors. So we initially had this electron degeneracy pressure, so that all these electrons in the, the core of the star that were providing pressure support are suddenly disappearing because they're captured on, on the protons. Um, so we're not only beginning to collapse, but this collapse accelerates as it goes on because the electrons start to disappear 
uh, through these electron capture processes, which result in this emission of electron neutrinos. Um, our sort of second phase, which is very quickly thereafter, about 0.1 seconds after that initial collapse phase, um, we start to see uh, this iron, initial iron and nickel composition become so compressed that we get these sort of ultra heavy nuclei that stop even looking like nuclei like we think about them. Um, and the densities become so large that the neutrinos are trapped. So in this region here, um, where the densities are about 10 to the 12 grams per centimeter cubed, uh, the neutrinos have to sort of random walk their way out. They can no longer uh, free stream outwards. Uh, in our step three, which is um, 0.11 seconds after that initial collapse, uh, we get pure nuclear matter in the very center of its collapsing core. The densities are so high, they're uh, about 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cubed. Again, the densities are so high that these neutrinos, although they're, they're being produced both thermally and through electron capture processes, uh, they can no longer uh, make their way out of the star freely. So we have all these, these trapped neutrinos that are produced um, down here, uh, but can't escape. Um, we still have electron captures going on above it, uh, which are resulting in um, electron neutrino emissions. And at this point, we still have this infalling material up here, uh, but the matter densities are so high that the sort of uh, strong core of the nuclear force um, sort of provides a rebounding force. So that the, the inner core has reached such high densities that it begins to rebound outwards. And this leads to this propagation of this, this shock that, that gets to drive outwards from this material um, and what will result, hopefully, in an explosion. Um, and we get finally sort of our neutrino burst and, and later shock propagation. And that shock that was initially formed uh, down here, where, where we've reached nuclear matter density, has propagated outwards some ways. But as it propagates to this material, which is largely composed of iron and nickel, it loses a lot of its initial energy uh, to sort of the photodissociation of this material. So although we had an initially very energetic shock that was moving outwards, it slows and eventually stalls. And this is sort of, we get stuck with this problem, is that we have this initially very energetic shock, which has all the energy it needs to create a 10 to the 51 Earth explosion, which is exactly what we want, um, actually loses all of its energy. We just end up with a stalled shock. And the trick is, how do we take this shock that's just stuck there above this cooling proto-neutron star, which is slowly emitting neutrinos, um, and how do we re-energize that shock and get a successful explosion? Um, and here's step five is explosion question mark, because we're still not entirely sure how this process ha happened or how frequently it happened. Because um, there's sort of this very delicate setup going on where we have this cooling proto-neutron star, which is at a, a few times nuclear matter density. We have trapped neutrinos. The neutrinos are being produced uh, largely through thermal processes. So this whole proto-neutron star is very hot. It's cooling through the emission of, of neutrino anti-neutrino pairs. Um, so these neutrinos can provide a lot of energy. And uh, most of the gravitational binding energy of the system is released in the form of neutrinos. Um, but how to get all of that energy to where we need it, to this shock, is just sort of the, the underlying question. So we have our stalled shock further out. And between this cooling proto-neutron star, uh, what will be left behind is the neutron star remnant. Um, and the shock, there are these two important regions. There's a region of neutrino cooling, um, where there's uh, net energy loss to neutrinos through these uh, electron capture processes highlighted here. And then there's above that uh, a region of net neutrino heating, um, where the reverse processes are happening. So we're seeing that predominantly electron captures on neutrons and protons are leading to a net heating of the material. And it's this balance between cooling and heating um, that's really, what well, was initially thought to be really key to revitalizing this shock with a lot of energy and neutrinos. And if we, if we can get it at the right place at the right time, we can get a successful explosion. Um, and in addition to that, there's also a lot of convection going on in this region as well uh, between these two layers. So we sort of leave off there, we, where we think we get an explosion, we have all the energy we need to for an explosion, but how do we actually make these things explode? And how they, do they happen in nature? We see core collapse supernovae throughout the universe in every galaxy. They're not rare phenomena in any, to any extent, um, but when we put all of this physics into a, a computer simulation, we struggle to get successful explosion. Uh, so there's some sort of delicate physics that we're, we have had a lot of struggle uh, to understand uh, that drives these explosions. So in this next section, I'll sort of overview our current understanding of the explosion mechanism um, and, and what we think is going on, uh, which is largely um, this, this idea of the current explosion mechanism is really based on our understanding of multidimensional simulation. Uh, so this is a, a video of a 3D simulation um, done using the flash supernova code. Um, and this is plotted here as the entropy. And so you'll see this little purple ball. The little purple ball in the center is our pretty neutron star. And this outer layer is sort of where our shock is. And as you can see, as this shock initially stalls, and there's all this sloshing motion, this convection going on um, between the protein neutron star and the shock, which begins to play a very, very large role in blowing this shock further out and eventually revitalizing the explosion um, as this computer plays out. 
So our initial attempts at modeling these systems in spherical symmetry, um, although we had a lot of the, the neutrino physics right, really failed to capture this multidimensional hydrodynamic effects, which um, as you can see are very violent and very important uh, to driving this explosion. Um, so if we wait just a minute, this will start to, to blow up. Yeah, there it goes. Um, so there's a, a lot of fluid flows going on that are very, very complicated. Um, so initially, although neutrinos seem sort of the, the key to the energetics of the system, again, they're 99% of the energy released from the, the gravitational collapse of this pretty neutron star, um, it ends up there's a lot of, of delicacy in the turbulence and the convection that also helps uh, drive this explosion as well. Um, and we see this really only in two and three dimensional sim simulations. This is not a phenomenon that we capture well in spherical symmetry. Um, and so this is the, the shock radius uh, versus time plus bounce for a 1D in black and then uh, 2D and 3D simulations in blue, green, and red. Um, and eta is a, a measure of the neutrino heating um, uh, shown here. So it's basically just the amount of neutrino heating that's going on in the, the region between the protein neutron star and the shock radius. And this e term is just the energy and turbulence, again, between that protein neutron star surface and the, the shock radius. And as you can see for the, the, radio, the radius evolution of this shock, all, all of these simulations give sort of similar results. So we can get very similar results in 2D, 3D, and 1D. Um, but the, the trick is that if we look at this neutrino heating, it takes significantly more neutrino heating, uh, this black line here, to, to drive successful explosion in 1D compared to 2D or 3D. And that's really because of the turbulence and because of these convective processes, which play a, a very important role in, in how these explosions happen. So again, 2D and 3D simulations require significantly less neutrino heating to, to achieve explosion um, with similar energetics. And the reason this happens is because uh, the turbulence behind the shock provides a sort of pressure support. So if we do what's called a Reynolds decomposition, we basically take the hydrodynamic equation and we separate them out into some sort of, or take our fluid velocity, which is U, we separate it out into some sort of background fluid flow and also sort of a, a perturbation from the turbulence with convection on top of that. And we can then go through and do this sort of expansion what we find is we get something that looks very, very similar to our usual hydrodynamic equation. Um, so the evolution of this sort of background fluid flow, but there's an extra term that pops out here called the Reynolds stress, which goes as the turbulent velocity squared. And that acts just like a pressure in this hydrodynamic equation. So we have to basically get extra pressure from turbulence um, than we get from sort of just the, the gas pressure. Um, and this is what helps uh, drive these explosions. We have a plot here from David Radice simulations which show the relative contribution contribution compared to the, the total pressure versus time post bounce um, of various different terms that um, contribute to the pressure in the simulations. And this blue line here is the, the turbulent pressure term, this Reynolds stress. And as you can see, it contributes up to 40% of the total pressure um, in the region between the protein neutron star and the, the shock radius. So this is very important for the evolution of the system and really has very little to do with the neutrino heating directly. So this turbulent pressure is really vital and it's really this key thing that separates 1D simulations from 2D and 3D simulations. So why use spherical symmetry at all? As I've just shown you um, and I've just been talking about for the last few minutes, we have all these great 2D and 3D simulations that have this great turbulent effect that drives explosions. So why do we even need spherical symmetry? Just sort of the basis of my talk is using spherical symmetry to explore core collapse supernovae. And it may seem sort of like a, a strange thing, but there's a lot of things that we can't get at right now using uh, 2D and 3D simulations. Um, and this is because 2D and 3D simulations are very, very computationally expensive. So 3D simulations, for example, we can get through maybe five simulations a year, which doesn't do, let us do a lot in terms of uh, sensitivity studies and population studies. So for example, uh, when you talk about population studies, we have this whole range of progenitor masses that could lead to core collapse supernovae. But as I said, everything from about 10 solar masses upwards. Um, this is a plot I took from uh, T. Suckbolt's paper um, where he was looking at the explodability of a range of progenitor masses. Our initial idea was that everything up to about 40 solar masses resulted in a neutron star and everything above that resulted in a black hole. But what we've discovered using just our understanding of spherical symmetric simulation is that this is a much more diverse landscape. There's a non-monotonic behavior in the explodability um, with progenitor mass. Um, so this is the explosion uh, energy versus a zero H main sequence mass for the progenitor star. And as you can see, there's sort of these, these lower mass stars that all explode reliably, um, but then we get sort of these islands that, that don't explode in between 20 and 25 solar masses, for example, and 60 solar masses explodes, and 120 does, it, does as well. Um, so this sort of um, strange behavior that we see in the explodability, which has to do with the, the compactness of the, the core of the star. Um, so compactness is basically the mass 
contained in some radius. Um, and that's a, a plot here. As you can see, there's sort of this non-monotonic behavior. We get big bumps and spikes in it um, with various progenitor masses. And if we want to look at the, the evolution of all of these different uh, progenitor masses, we can't really do that in 3D if we're only running about five simulations a year, if we want to get this whole order of magnitude in, uh, in progenitor mass. So this is an example of, of why we need to use spherical symmetry to study core collapse supernovae. Additionally, the nuclear equipment state, um, there are countless numbers of uh, parameterizations to nuclear equipment state available. Um, so I pulled some of these tables from various future papers, but as you can see, there are just all of these possible parameterizations the nuclear interaction that we can put into our supernova and explore, like it keeps going. <laughs> um, so there, there's a lot up there as well, where we can, if we want to study the sensitivity to the nuclear equipment state, Again, we just don't have the computational power to use 3D. So this is another case where, where spherical symmetry is important. Um, so again, there are tens to hundreds of descriptions of nuclear matter available. Um, this uh, plot here on the left is uh, the mass versus radius diagram for uh, new cold neutron stars, so zero temperature nuclear equation of state. And even that shows a great variability from equation of state to equation of state. So as you can imagine, as we put these different equations of state in core collapse supernova simulations, we again see this variety of, of behaviors this plot down here is uh, shock radius versus time of bounce um, for various different uh, neutrino heating parameters in the different colors, uh, but the dashed, dotted, and solid lines are different equations of state. And just this simple shock radius evolution shows this variety of behaviors uh, for just a different equation of state, all of other things being held equal. Um, so if we want to study the sensitivity to equations of state, um, we again need spherical symmetry to be able to run as many simulations. Uh, and this is just a, a plot of the entropy profile from 2D simulations done with different equations of state. Uh, so this is the LS180, 220, and then the Steiner equation of state. And as you can say, see, not only does the shock radius vary uh, greatly between these different simulations, but we get very, very different local behaviors as well. These are all taken from about 300 seconds, uh, 300 milliseconds post bounds. We see varying uh, behaviors in the, the entropy profile as well, which will release, uh, lead to very different behaviors in nuclear synthesis and other products as well. Uh, which gets to my, my final point is in studying nuclear synthesis as well, we really need spherically symmetric simulations. Um, we have this yellow color, so you notes which, which elements are predominantly made by exploding massive stars, so core collapse supernovae. And if we want to understand um, sort of how uh, these elements are made and, and in what quantities can match this to our understanding of galactic chemical evolution, uh, we really need spherically symmetric models um, because we can't run out to the set of the late times to see the full nucleosynthetic products using uh, 3D simulations just in the computational products. So if we want to start getting at these sort of things and get a collective chemical evolution, uh, again, you need spherical symmetry. So the point of all this is that we will be dependent on 1D simulations uh, for the foreseeable future, just due to the computational cost of 3D, and the fact that there are all of these problems that we want to be able to address, uh, but can't address using 3D simulation. Um, so when we use spherical symmetry, because the explosion mechanism of core collapse supernovae is sort of inherently multidimensional, we were really reliant on these sort of artificial explosion mechanisms. And a few of the popular ways to do it are uh, using a piston method, uh, which is done using the sort of infamous Kepler code, uh, where you just deposit a bunch of momentum between the protein neutron star and the shock, and that boosts the thing outwards. Um, another popular approach is using a thermal bomb. So instead of putting a bunch of momentum between the protein neutron star and the shock, you put a bunch of thermal energy in there. Uh, and more recent development is, is the push method, which relies on sort of coupling the neutrino heating and enhancing that uh, between the, this protein neutron star and the shock to deposit extra energy there. Uh, and drive an explosion that way. So all of these above um, are sort of fit to result in explosion energies and nickel production. These sort are of things that we expect from measuring uh, supernova 1987A and, and sometimes crap as well. Um, and so we can match these sort of global properties of explosion energies in nuclear synthesis, um, but the, the local behaviors that they, they result in are going to be very, very different from what we see in 3D because they're inherently artificial explosion mechanisms. So this is where multi-D simulations can help us with our understanding of spherical symmetry. Um, because we often don't sort of tie the two together, they're very different approaches to the problem. But our understanding of multi-D supernova simulations can also help us develop better sp spherical symmetric uh, simulations. So as I said before, we have these sort of global quantities that we tend to think about when we're trying to, to match spherically symmetric simulations and, and fit our parameters in these artificial explosions. Um, but there are also sort of local properties that we can use as well uh, when we're looking at 3D simulations, that these multi-D simulations can now give us local thermodynamic and composition profiles that we can match our spherical symmetric models to, um, as well as sort of behaviors and turbulence and things like that. 
And this is actually very important. So this is a plot of entropy on the, the, this axis here, the electron fraction on this axis, the blue lines are the electron fraction, the red, the entropy, and the solid lines are 3D simulations, and the dashed lines are 1D simulations. And as you can see, um, for 3D versus 1D simulations, we get drastically different profiles in the entropy and composition. So these are simulations that give us similar shock radius evolution, similar explosion energies. Um, but if we want to look at the details of the simulation, we want to look at the nucleosynthesis, for example, these are going to give us drastically different results um, just because the composition pro profiles and entropy profiles are so drastically different. Um, so matching better to 3D in a, a local environment can really change our understanding of zero-point symmetric simulations. So this has been the, the project that we've undertaken is to try and model turbulence in spherical symmetry so that we can get this very realistic explosion mechanism, this turbulence-based explosion in spherical symmetry and match it to these 3D simulations in a local way so that we're no longer matching to global properties of the, the explosions but to more local behaviors. So our goals with this project are to reproduce this very physical explosion mechanism that we see in 2D and 3D uh, and also to reproduce this local behavior of the turbulence um, in a spherically symmetric simulation. And um, this is to, the hope is to better replicate the local thermodynamics and therefore get out more reliable nucleosynthesis. Um, and also hopefully by matching to more local conditions, so instead of matching to explosion energies of simulations, we'll match to these local uh, thermodynamic and uh, turbulence profiles. And by doing that matching, hopefully we'll then, then again be able to reproduce these global quantities that we measure from, from 1987A. Uh, and with these simulations, we can provide predictions of explodability of, of different progenitor masses, nucleosynthesis products, and, and neutrino spectrum luminosities. Uh, so how do we do this? Um, turbulence in, in spherical symmetry seems a little counterintuitive, and we sort of have to, to fake it until we make it, because we can't inherently model these multidimensional hydrogen effects. So when we're trying to, to model this convection, there's sort of two regions that we have to worry about. Um, this is uh, a plot of radius uh, versus time post bounce, and the coloring is what's called the brunt weissler frequency, which is the strength of the convection. Um, if it's blue, if it's positive, there's no convection. And if it's red um, or negative, then that means that there's convection going on. Uh, and this red line here is the gain radi radius, and the, the green line is the shock radius. So as you can see, there's a red region of convection deep in the protein neutron star that we have to try and, and replicate. And also this convection that happens between the protein neutron star and the shock. Um, which we also have to try and model as well. And in our, in our work, uh, we've been treating these regions very differently just because the convection that happens in these regions uh, does behave quite differently. So if we're looking at the protein neutron star convection, we use sort of this traditional approach to mixing like theory. Uh, mixing like theory is very, very old. It's been around forever. It's used very commonly in stellar, stellar modeling. Um, you can find it in things like MESA. Uh, and it basically sets the strength of the convection using this burnt bisolar frequency, um, which I mentioned before. And this is just calculated using various gradients of thermodynamic properties uh, that we find in our sphere of the symmetric simulation. Um, so just by calculating this, um, we can guess at the strength of the convection happening in that region. And again, if it's positive, there's no convection going on. It's negative, tells us that there's convection. Um, and we can couple that with a length scale um, because convection all happens over some length scale. Um, and here we've said that our length scale for the, the protein neutron star convection is just some fitting parameter, which we call alpha, um, times the radius of the protein neutron star. So we're going to have um, this sort of length scale that's built into the problem as well. And this is sort of artificial. This is where the name mixing length theory comes in, is that in realistic convection, so this is the energy of turbulence versus the different length scale of the turbulence, we see this cascade of energies being distributed across different length scales. But in mixing length theory, we just have to pick one and call that the end of the day, um, because that's the best that we can do in spherical symmetry. So now that we have a length scale and this, this uh, from five solar frequency, uh, we can couple the two together to get um, the, the turbulent velocity in this region. Um, now for the, the gain region convection, we've taken a very different approach here because the, the turbulence that happens in this region is closely coupled to the energy of the neutrino heating. Uh, they come into sort of an equilibrium process. Um, and so we, we find that the, the local neutrino heating goes something like the, the turbulent velocity in this region um, divided by the length scale of where this convection is happening. Um, and we've again set, set our length scale in this, this problem to be some beta fitting parameter uh, times the size of this gain region, this, this turbulence and neutrino heating is happening. So we have these two very, very different pieces of convection, two very different ways of modeling them, uh, but this captures the behavior of the local turbulence um, based on the properties of our, our models. So now that we have turbulent velocities calculated for all these regions of convection, 
And we then add this back into our hydro, and this is sort of a new thing that we're doing compared to previous attempts at looking at, at turbulence and spherical symmetry uh, for core collapse supernova, is that we're then going to try and model this Reynolds stress term that I mentioned before. So again, we do that Reynolds decomposition where we break up our, our velocity into a background flow and the, the turbulent velocity is. We get out this extra pressure term here, this Reynolds stress that goes like the turbulent velocity squared. And so we then just plug in those turbulent velocities we calculated, as I mentioned before, into our hydrodynamic equations. We get extra pressure support um, that drives the equation or drives the explosion. Uh, and there's a similar equation for energy where we get some extra terms there uh, that add to the, the pressure support. So as I mentioned, there's sort of two parameters that we need to fit to our 3D simulation. Um, that's alpha and beta, which describe the proto-neutron star convection and the gain region convection, respectively. And we can fit these to the, the very local property of 3D simulations. So we've put all of this into the flash supernova code. Um, this has lots of uh, interesting components. We have a realistic nuclear equation of state. Um, we have a GR effective potential. Um, so it's not full general relativity. Uh, it's just an effective potential, but it, it mimics the result of full GR quite well. Um, we have lots of details hydrodynamics, which I'm not going to go into in detail here, uh, but the, the turbulence couples into that. Um, we also have various neutrino transport routines we can use, uh, including an M1 spectral transport routine, which is sort of a cutting edge of neutrino transport uh, in supernovae right now. Uh, and the great thing about the flash code is that it is multi-dimensional. So we can use uh, 1D simulations and 3D simulations coming out of the same code. So when we're trying to match the res our spherically symmetric results and match this turbulence and spherical symmetry to the results of uh, 3D simulations, um, we can use the, the same routines and the same equation state, and the same everything so that we're not getting a weird numerical disparities from using different, different techniques of modeling. Um, we get a better match. Uh, so I have some preliminary results. This is sort of an ongoing project that's, that's not come to completion yet, but I can uh, show you what we have going on right now. Uh, so the first step was sort of fitting these parameters, you know, this alpha and beta parameter, uh, that we needed to fit to 3D simulations. Uh, I'm not going to show you plots of what happens when we vary alpha, because it's actually very boring. Um, it fits quite well falling out of the mixing length theory to what we expect out of 3D. If you turn alpha up too far, you end up blowing apart your proto neutron star, but we don't want that result anyway. Um, but if I vary beta, we get some very interesting results. So beta, again, is what's scaling the, the convection and the turbulence in this region between the party neutron star and the shock radius. And so as we increase beta, we see that our explosions become uh, more and more energetic and more props. This is a, a plot of shock radius versus time plus bounds uh, for various values of beta. So the black is with no MLT and then going from uh, 0.20, uh, beta of 0.20 up to about 0.28. As you can see, we get this fan of possible solutions um, for various values of beta. So this is well, exactly what we want to see, where changing beta changes the evolution of our system. The stronger values of beta and the stronger values of the, the turbulence, which means a, a stronger explosion. Um, and these are just some of the, the things that went into the simulation. We have a 20 solar mass progenitor. I'm using the LST20 equation of state. Now, when we compare the shock radius evolution, so comparing global properties uh, from uh, multi-D simulations to 1D simulations, um, as you can see, this is, uh, again, shock radius versus time plus bounce, but this time for 2D simulations done in the flash code. And we've seen very similar behaviors between the 2D simulations and what we've seen from our, our 1D simulations. Um, so this is for various progenitor masses. But if we look at the sort of yellowish gold line here, the, the 20 solar mass progenitor, you see this uh, initial shock, the shock goes out initially, begins to recede, and then explodes a little bit later. Um, so there's a, a delayed explosion here because of this, this turbulence. And we see a very similar property here where we, we see an initial recession of the shock before it reaches explosion. So we can mimic that set of shock radius uh, behavior in, in 1D using this turbulence method. And we get very similar explosion energies between 2D and 1D. Uh, these plots are just explosion energy versus time plus bounce um, for various parameters. Uh, just to, to give you some units here, one beta is 10 to 15 or to translate between these plots. Um, but for varying beta, you can see that we get very realistic energies, explosion energies, um, as what we see in 2D and 3D. Um, so if we look at the Reynolds stress, which is again that extra pressure term that comes into the hydrodynamic equation, and goes like the, the turbulent velocity squared. Uh, this is the Reynolds stress uh, versus, versus radius. Um, at various times post bounce, um, not the, the legend on this one, but the blue, I think, is 50 milliseconds post bounce, green is 100 milliseconds post bounce, purple is 150, and red is, is 200. Um, and so we can calculate, we can take spherically, uh, spherically average 3D simulations um, and get a value for the Reynolds stress versus radius, and then compare that to what we see in 1D. And in 1D, uh, we get uh, at 100 milliseconds post-bounce, so compared to this, this greenish line, we get very similar values between 
the, the 1D simulation, just what we see falling out of our spherical symmetric simulations, and what we see naturally arising in, in 3D. And again, if we follow the evolution uh, for 1D simulations, this is 150 milliseconds post-bounce, we can see that our, our Reynolds stress is growing naturally compared to what we see in 3D. Um, and again, so the, the relative contribution to the pressure, uh, this is something we looked at before, so this is the, the contribution of this turbulent pressure term to the total pressure. Uh, it peaks at about 0.4 in these 3D simulations. And we can see in 1D, um, again, comparing to 100 milliseconds post-bounce, we see this very natural growth in the, the contribution of total pressure, which mimics the behavior that naturally falls out of the 3D simulation. Um, so what's next? Um, this is, again, some preliminary work, so we still have a lot of questions that we want to answer in terms of the viability of this method and, and, and into what it can tell us about the core collapse supernova in the future. Um, so we've developed this new tool for exploring the sensitivities of nuclear equations. These are the questions we want to get at are sensitivities to the nuclear equation state and the nuclear synthesis. Um, but there's still a lot of things that we want to answer first before we start getting at that. Uh, the first being, um, how does it reproduce this explosion mechanism in 3D? Our goal here was to really reproduce this physical explosion mechanism of the turbulence. And we want to know how well we're doing that. If we take one set of parameters, one alpha and beta, to, to fit our turbulence model, um, does that match the 3D results for different progenitors? Does that translate to different environments or different equation state or nutrient transport regimes, for example? How robust is this fitting that we're doing uh, to these 3D simulations? Um, and does fitting to these 3D models in sort of a local way, we're trying to match the, the turbulent velocities and you know, the turbulent pressures to the 3D models in a local way, um, but how well does that reproduce global quantities that are well known from something like the 19th SMA, for example, the explosion of energies in the nickel production? Um, can we reproduce that uh, similarly? And finally, what would the universe look like uh, with this model of a core collapse supernova explosion? Um, which progenitors explode and which ones don't? Do we see this sort of variability with progenitor mass and explodability? that other people have seen with other explosion models. Um, and sort of what are the remnant mass distributions that are left behind? How many black holes do we get versus neutron stars? Um, and finally, what nuclear synthesis results from these explosions? And how does that feed back into galactic chemical evolution? And all of these questions are very much dependent on coupling these 1D simulations, which are necessary in getting at nuclear synthesis and sensitivity to nuclear equation state with the 3D models and our understanding of the 3D explosion models. Um, so we really need both of these things, the 3D models and the 1D. Uh, to start to address this in this way. So thank you all for uh, listening. I'm happy to take questions. We've got lots of time. So. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, if there are any questions, please indicate so in the chat, but I would suggest that you locally start with the questions because it's just easier. Yes. I may have missed it, but um, in a part of um, like radii as a function of time, different models, they were all very close, and then there was a certain point where they started to diverge. And or, oh, this one? Yeah, so for example, um, yeah, what, what happens at that time, can you remind me? Uh, sort of this time? Yeah, where they, mm -hmm. before that, even when they all started to diverge, it was sort of missable. Oh, this is sort of the way the, the strength of the convection sort of naturally grows with time, there's sort of a turn on time. So initially, even for various values of, of beta, it's just small enough that it doesn't really matter. Okay. And then as it grows, they sort of start to diverge. Okay. And that's, that's where the gain region appears. Hi, Mackenzie. Who, who is this? Is that Sean? Yep. <laughs> OK. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Do you have a guess how this may impact nuclear synthesis compared to other explosion mechanisms like the push method? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what the outcome would be, but I expect very different out outcomes, or at least slightly different. Um, just because if you look at, um, go back to the beginning, um, yeah, if we look at this plot, for example, which is the, the entropy and Y e profiles from 3D to 1D, if we have a 1D model that better mimics this, this 3D simulation with flatter entropy profiles, and, the flatter YE profiles, um, we're going to see very different nucleosynthesis than, than we see in other 1D techniques. No, I don't, I don't want to try and guess that. <laughs> Not going on the record. <laughs> okay, we, we have a question here. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I have a question uh, about uh, 3D uh, hydro. Um, 
the latest um, simulation by uh, Yonka uh, and collaborators have uh, shown that uh, the SASI uh, mechanism is an important uh, is important to describe and to reproduce explosion. Uh, in your case, um, uh, how, how could you modelize such a 3D process? That is a good question. Um, I have currently have no ideas on how to, to, to replicate the effects of SASE in 1D. Um, but in the simulations that are done with Flash, SASE, SASE seems to be a less dominant effect. Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, which I know. Um, but SASE seems to be less dominant than turbulence um, in the Flash code anyway. Does that sound correct? Yeah, I think in 3D, like SASE is less important, but in 2D, SASE is pretty strong. Okay. Okay. Further questions? Benoit has one here. Ah, okay, please go ahead. Uh, so, uh, in the, the plot where the radius is a function of time, so uh, well, if we were to look at uh, 1D models, not the one that you have your alpha and beta parameters, but uh, like typical one for the push metal or the other ones, uh, do we see this increasing and then falling back before it explodes, or it's just a straight line going up? Or how does that plot look like? In, Classical one D simulation. That's a good question. Um, the shock recession, for example, with the piston method is a little harder because you're just sort of pushing it outwards. Um, so I guess you could time it until after the shock recedes, but it's it's all sort of artificial, artificially done. If that makes sense, where you can wait until the shock recedes and then add a bunch of energy and blow it up, but then you're sort of picking that time when that shock starts to go back outwards again. Whereas here we haven't picked a special time in our simulation. It's just because the way that the turbulence naturally grows, we get this recession and it starts to naturally explode again. Yeah. So and on the same plot, do you so you, you go from no mixing length up to the different betas? Um, do you have any idea or what like could you add lines to this where it's like you, you do kind of traditional MLT without the like I'm just curious what the impact of the turbulence in particular is. Like, would you still get this behavior with classical MLP or? Uh, no. Um, this is, so this effect here with this sort of fan of, of results and explosions is very much a result of adding that, that turbulent pressure to the hydro. Um, traditional MLT um, won't result in explosions in this way. So if I turned off beta and just had alpha, for example, they wouldn't explode. What if you did like, the alpha approximation for both regions, or does that not make sense? It would make sense, I see what you mean. Right. Um, and again, it's it's not really adding that turbulent pressure, so it's not. It also sort of change the local thermodynamics, where you sort of get this this mixing of the, the entropy and wave profiles in a different way, but you don't have that extra pressure support that's needed for the explosion. So for other 1D codes that do explode, do they just have higher neutrino luminosities, or like how do they make it explode without? Without this, um, it depends on who you ask. Uh, there are a couple of ways. Uh, yes, um, a couple of different ways of doing it. So, like Kepler does it by just adding momentum 